So here it is, the long-awaited 2022 Asus Zephyrus G15. Many of you were asking me about this one and were excited about it. And I was super excited to get my hands on it as well because it includes some very critical features that were missing on the 2021 model. Like, you know, the webcam and of course the muck switch. So overall, the differences aren't too major. There is more than I expected and we'll talk about that here in a moment. So I have the American model of the G15. It has an AMD Ryzen 6900HS for the CPU. And for the GPU, you've got an NVIDIA RTX 3070 Ti. The key difference here between this year's 6900HS and last year's 5900HS seems to be mostly just efficiency, um, better performance on battery, and that sweet, sweet new RDNA 2 integrated graphics. Yes, I'm talking about the Radeon 680M um, that's built into this, and I'll show you how good that is in a second. On the GPU side, we now have a TI after the 3070, and that's it. They just added TI. Now, nah, but supposedly the TI GPUs are exclusive to NVIDIA's Max-Q4 feature set, uh, which includes Battery Boost 2.0, and some other improvements to their max Q features. I mean, which could all be a marketing gimmick, but we're gonna test that as well. And of course, we now have 120 watts going to the GPU instead of 100 watts. We're also gonna see if those extra 20 watts really make a difference. That now puts the G15 at only 30 watts behind the maximum configuration for the 3070 Ti, which is 150 watts. And as I've shown in previous videos, um, there's typically diminishing returns on wattage, at least for the 3070 GPU. So we're gonna see if that still holds true for this generation as well. All right, so first let's talk design. Not much has changed here at all from the 2021 model, um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing since this is still a very nice sleek looking laptop. The build is magnesium alloy, which feels really solid and sturdy. Uh, sure, it's not quite as metal feeling as like aluminum laptops like the Legion 7 or Razer Blade, but it definitely doesn't feel cheap or plasticky either. Um, it's also very resistant to fingerprints, which is much appreciated as that is a pet peeve of mine. And one of the reasons I prefer this over the Razer Blade, which is a fingerprint magnet, or the Zephyrus M16, which looks very similar to the G15, but has a, like this rubbery finish and it picks up fingerprints a lot more. Um, I think they changed this little plate right here and gave it like a purplish hue. I don't know why, but whatever. Um, it's not even noticeable really. You also have that nice like colorful reflection on the lid if the light hits it at just the right angle. Uh, you still have your ergo lift hinge, which lifts the laptop for better cooling. And of course the ventilation that sort of hits the bottom bezel. Um, to this day though, from the 2021 model, I've never actually seen anyone's G15 get damaged from this ventilation. I used mine for a whole year, nothing ever happened. So I did see some bezel issues that people had with a few of their units, but after some people in the community investigated this, it seems like some units were just sent out with weak bezel glue, which is actually a problem that's seen on many gaming laptops. Sometimes you just get a dud. So apparently, I mean, it takes way hotter temperatures to actually warp plastic or damage an LCD screen. So it's really nothing to be worried about. Um, plus, many other laptops share a similar design to this. In fact, I was gaming and I put my hand up to the exhaust on this 2022 model. And I think they somehow lessened the amount of air that gets exhausted here uh, because I could barely feel anything coming out. So I don't know. Maybe they did that to help calm some of the people who were nervous about that being an issue or I don't know. Um, and I know a lot of people just had concerns over the quality control in general on last year's model. Uh, this one has been perfect for me. No visible screen bleed, no quirky issues. Uh, everything functions perfectly. And this is a retail model that I bought myself from Best Buy. So uh, just remember that quality control issues are mostly rare, uh, but they are inevitably going to happen to some unlucky people. When you're on a laptop's forum or subreddit, that's the primary post you're going to see for any brand is people having issues. And the more popular a laptop is, the more posts you're going to see like that. So I mean, just remember, the large majority of users likely have a perfectly fine laptop, and you probably don't see them on there posting how amazing their laptop is on these forums because they're too busy enjoying their machine. You know, you're much more likely to post something when you're having an issue. But anyways, moving on to the display on this year's G15, it is the same QHD 165Hz display as last year's model, although I feel like it's a little brighter now somehow. It's supposed to measure around 300 nits, and maybe I just got lucky, but mine definitely seems like it's closer to 350 nits or even 
a bit higher than that. I don't know. But panels do vary from unit to unit, so it could just be luck of the draw. Um, the color gamut is still amazing. You can usually tell right away when you're using a laptop with a good color gamut. The colors just pop, and it's great too for uh, color sensitive work like photo and video editing. Um, I find it strange though that some regions got a 240 hertz QHD panel, and in the US we've only got the 165 hertz one, at least on this model. So I don't know what happened there. Um, but I can't complain though, since I don't really push any games over 165 FPS anyway, and I'd bet this panel probably gets better battery life too than the 240 hertz one. Also, AMD Radeon's Very Bright is still enabled by default here, so make sure to turn that off in your Radeon settings when you get this. Although now it does have a slider there, and I noticed it doesn't completely destroy the colors and brightness this time like it did on the 2021 model, so that's nice at least. Also, the hinge goes back a full 180 degrees. Um, I don't remember if it did that before since I never tried it, but yeah, that's a thing. Um, here's a major difference though from last year's model, they finally gave us a webcam. I have no idea why Asus thought that was a good idea last year to not have a webcam on their laptops, but I'm glad they listened to us this time around. Uh, plus it supports Windows Hello, which is much faster and more accurate, I feel like, than signing in with the uh, finicky sort of fingerprint scanner that they had last year. I also like how it sits flush with the bezel. Um, I think that just looks much cleaner than the ones that poke out at the top a bit. Um, however, the quality of the webcam, I mean, it's just very mediocre, very average for a gaming laptop, which means it's not that good. Um, in decent lighting, things look okay, but in low light, you're better off using the camera from a Nintendo 3DS or something. Uh, the keyboard is still one of my favorite favorites from any gaming laptop. It's centered, there's good key travel, and it just feels very premium. Um, it also has single zone RGB for all regions now, which is great to see uh, since it seemed like last year's model only a few regions actually got RGB on the keyboard for some reason. And you can customize that however you want in Armory Crate. Another thing is when I was watching Jared's Tech's video on his 2022 G15 is he had pretty noticeable keyboard flex on his. Mine really didn't have that at all. I tried pushing really hard on the keyboard deck, um, didn't really flex. And same with the key pressing, um, it didn't really bring any other keys down with it. So I'm not sure if that's just the difference between the US models and overseas, but I just wasn't able to replicate that with mine. Also, I don't know if you could do this on last year's model, but in Armory Crate, you can change these four um, function buttons at the top to do a variety of different functions now. So for me, since I never used the mic mute button or the armory crate button, I've changed mine to be brightness up and down here. So that way I can just change my brightness without having to hold down the function key. And yes, there's no function lock for some reason on this laptop. So this is a great workaround at least. The trackpad is still also one of my favorites from any gaming laptop. Um, it's a huge glass trackpad and it just feels great to use. Um, and some of you probably already know I'm not the biggest fan of off-centered trackpads. So this one being centered is a huge plus for me. Um, it just feels more natural and you don't have to worry about palm rejection as much. This model's trackpad also feels better somehow than last year's, and I'm not sure why, like the click is a little quieter and softer feeling, but I, I like it. Um, same with the keyboard, it also seems quieter to type on than last year's model. Here's a clip of how each one sounds. Also, another subtle difference is that the little rubber feet on the bottom of the hinge feel a little more solid this year because I don't know, I, I feel like the 2021 model, um, these felt like they could be just wiggled off pretty easily. And also, I think they added an extra layer of padding right here under the bezel um, so that you're not bending the bottom bezel um, and the lid if you grip it too tightly while it's closed. I don't know if that was there before, but I noticed it this time. Maybe I just didn't see it before. I don't know. The 2022 G15 comes with a 240 watt charger this year um, instead of the 200 watt one, which you can see here is slightly larger, but not too much. Uh, the biggest difference really between the two chargers is that the cable that plugs into the wall is a thicker gauge. So I will sort of miss how small and flexible last year's was, but at least it's still nowhere near as bulky and heavy as the 300 watt chargers that come with the Lenovo Legion series. But yeah, anyways, the G15 overall is just a sleek, slim, and lightweight gaming laptop. A great design from Asus that isn't too gamery and it's easy to carry with you. It's much lighter than um, the offerings from Lenovo's Legion line or Alienware or things like that, which is definitely something to think about if you're a student or you often travel with your laptop. All right, so ports. These are still the same as last year, uh, but with one small change, you now have USB 4 capabilities, and I believe it's in the two USB-C ports. 
So that means that these are Thunderbolt 3 compatible, which is cool to see that finally being implemented and not exclusive to Intel. Now, I'm not sure if they're already active or if we're still waiting on a driver update before they get that functionality. Uh, but the problem is I don't really have anything to check it with. The best thing I could do was I tried using this uh, solid state drive enclosure that supposedly runs at Thunderbolt speeds, but the transfer speeds were about the same, just a little bit higher than when I plugged it into the Legion 7 with the 5900HX. So reading and writing speed was between like 800 to 1000 uh, megabytes a second when running Crystal Disk Mark. But I'll leave a comment um, if or when I confirm that we receive USB 4. So for the rest of the ports, you've got your power input, um, Ethernet, USB Type-A, um, HDMI 2.0B. I don't know why Asus couldn't just make this 2.1, but whatever. Um, and then your audio combo jack. On the other side, you've got another USB Type-A port and micro SD card slot. A lot of people say they'd rather have a full-size SD card slot here, but I kind of like the micro SD because it can be used as a nice little uh, cheap and easy storage expansion since it doesn't stick out or anything uh, like the full-size slots usually do. I put a 256 gig card in mine and now I just have an extra 256 gigs that I can use for photos, videos, or whatever where I don't care about the transfer speed as much. Um, it's decently fast but I've definitely seen at least double these speeds out, out there on other laptops. So the speakers got nerfed a little bit on this 2022 model. Uh, they're still some of the better gaming laptop speakers for sure, but the 2021 model just had more punchy bass, whereas on these you can tell they definitely dialed it back a bit. Um, and that's probably because Asus was overcompensating for the whole speaker pop issue from last year. Many of you may know that the 2021 models, uh, they had popping speakers when you played something too bassy or too loud, which was later fixed in a driver update, but I guess Asus just didn't want to take that chance uh, this year, which makes me a little little sad actually because I'll miss that extra bass but at least you can EQ it in the Dolby sound settings to make it sound pretty good um, a little better than it does stock for sure I always like to give a comparison when I show these clips so here's the new speakers um, in comparison to the Legion 7 which also has fairly decent speakers for a gaming laptop And unfortunately, I had to sell my old G15 to afford to buy this one. Small YouTuber moment. But I'll just still play the old clip of the old G15 speakers. Just know it might not truly represent or be a good comparison since it was recorded probably at a different distance away and on a different part of the game that's gone now. All right, so let's talk about internals. Uh, the insides are pretty much the same as last year's model as well, but with two key differences. So now you've got PCIe Gen 4 SSDs instead of Gen 3. Uh, so much faster read and write speeds there. However, the drive that mine came with um, is sort of a sad excuse for Gen 4 SSD. I mean, it's not the slowest, but it's just barely above, you know, we're in like the 3000 range for uh, read and write, which, you know, it's, it's good and all. I mean, it's great, but it's, you know, I've seen Gen for get twice these speeds so um so yeah i made sure to order an actually decent gen 4 drive instead and use that one as my primary and i'll use this one as my secondary uh, you still have one stick of ram soldered to the motherboard which a lot of companies like these just have to do to save space but at least this year the ram is ddr5 which should make the soldered ram less of a deal breaker um you'll want to make sure you're subscribed because i'm going to compare if there's any difference in having mismatched ram for ddr5 compared to ddr4 from last year so we'll see how that works out. Uh, DDR5 sticks run in dual channel independently and in quad channel together, so theoretically mismatching them should make less of a difference to performance, perhaps even increase performance, but we'll see. The way it should work is if you put a 16 gig stick in here for a total of 24, that the first 16 gigabytes utilized should run in quad channel and anything utilized after that will run in dual channel. So yeah, stay tuned for that. I'll link that video here when it's done. Uh, the cooling doesn't seem to have changed from what I can tell. The only other difference internally is that now there's like copper on the ends of these heat pipes right here and a little foam strip going along the middle, which I believe is there maybe to reduce flex from when you push in the middle of the bottom panel, uh, but I don't know for sure. 
All right, so Armory Crate, um, software-wise, this is your command center for this laptop. Um, it's a little different now that we have a MUX switch. So personally, I think Armory Crate is one of the better control centers out there uh, since they give you a lot more control over your system than most others do. You can customize your fan speeds at different temperature levels. You can change CPU wattage and boost wattage. Uh, you can adjust GPU overclocking. You can disable your GPU completely and much more. So let's quickly walk through the new Armory Crate. So front and center, you've got your performance profiles. Uh, Windows mode just uses the default Windows power plan. Silent mode prioritizes fan noise. So power is limited just to make sure the fans are quiet or completely off. And it does a great job doing that. Uh, and then performance mode gives you more power, but more CPU than GPU power. And then turbo gives you full wattage capabilities to both the CPU and GPU, which is 80 watts max on the CPU, 120 watts max on the GPU. Manual mode, I want to talk about for a minute because it is different this year. First of all, you can access manual mode on battery now and you get separate presets for manual mode on battery. So of course options are limited on battery, but the fact that you can do this now is a nice improvement. Um, so like on battery, you still get fan curves, um, CPU wattage control, but it's limited to 65 watts max instead of 80, which I mean, running 80 watts on battery is going to drain it so fast anyway. But, um, and the GPU only has the thermal target option that you can change. But when you're plugged in, that's when manual mode really comes in handy. So on the CPU tab, you can adjust your SPL, which is your sustained CPU wattage, uh, your SPPT, which is your boost wattage, and then your FPPT, which is like your short boost wattage. Uh, keep in mind though that the sustained wattage here is only possible in a CPU only workload. So don't expect to get 80 watts while gaming or anything. That's usually not going to happen. Uh, maybe on a loading screen for a little bit, but most games will always push the GPU. For fans, you can adjust their speeds according to temperature, with limits of course, so that you don't screw up anything. Um, I don't know why fan curves aren't more common in laptop control centers, but this one works really well and it can help you game a lot quieter without a huge hit to your performance either, and I'll go over that in more detail soon. On the GPU tab, you have your overclock settings and then a thermal target, which seems to be a max temperature limit. I've never seen the GPU get even close to 87 anyway, so I just leave it there for max performance, as lowering it to 75 or something definitely takes a slight hit to GPU performance. You can also adjust how much dynamic boost you want to give the GPU here, which is cool. So setting this to 5 only lets the GPU run up to 105 watts total, giving the CPU more headroom, while 120 lets the GPU run at up to 120 watts when it's needed. So that all just depends on the game you're playing and what settings you're playing at and resolution, whether it'll use the full 120 watts or not, but I found for the most part it gets there. GPU power savings is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, the higher you put this slider, the lower the clock speed and the wattage that the GPU is allowed, which can help with reducing temperatures and fan speeds, or when you just really don't need the GPU uh, to be actively working hard. All right, so now let's talk about the updated system configuration panel. So here we've got the MUX switch, of course. Um, what this does, for those of you who don't know, is it disables the integrated graphics completely so that you can get full performance from your RTX 3070 Ti. Um, this feature was not present in the 2021 G15, and it usually equals about a 10% performance increase in games, more or less depending on the title and the resolution. And then over here, you can do the opposite of that with MS Hybrid Mode. So this allows you to completely disable the DGPU instead so setting this to standard leaves your 3070 Ti active, but setting it to Eco completely disables the 3070 Ti. So you'll get way less graphics performance, but it maximizes battery life. Or at least it's supposed to work that way, but it doesn't, and I'll get to that. And then the optimized setting here is nice because it just makes it to where as soon as you unplug your laptop, it automatically switches for you so you don't have to manually do it yourself every time. Moving on, we have the ROG key here, which enables or disables the ROG button. You have the boot up sound, which can now be disabled right here without having to go further into the settings like you did on the 2021 model. Panel overdrive increases screen response time and panel power saver automatically switches the screen's refresh rate to 60 hertz when you're on battery, which is a great quality of life feature and it's not really found on other laptops, at least not to where it does it automatically. Personally, I don't do this and I still get great battery life, but it's an option that's nice to see. You also have your RGB controls here, uh, customizable macro keys, screen color calibration, um, scenario profiles, which allows you to automate certain power profiles depending on the application or the task you're doing, and of course updates and, and other little settings that don't matter too much. So the BIOS on this laptop, it just has basic features. I mean, it looks pretty nice, but nothing out of the ordinary here. Um, you know, nowhere near as much customization as like an MSI gaming laptop would give you, but it has what you would expect. I mean, it has everything you need unless you're just trying to do extensive tweaks that could potentially break your system, then you should check out MSI.
All right, so I want to dedicate a part of this video to the MUX switch real quick. So we have one now on the 2022 G15. This is a big reason why the 2021 G15 was typically found lower on reviewers' performance charts last year, because nobody could test it without NVIDIA Optimus getting in the way, unless they tested it with an external monitor hooked up to the USB-C port, which was the only way to run it in MUX mode or DGPU mode. Uh, no reviewers actually did that, which sucks, but I did it on mine and showed to everyone that you could nearly match the same performance as thicker and heavier laptops by doing so, or at least within a range where you wouldn't notice the difference. And people were obviously upset by this, but at least this year we should see the G15 higher interview charts because of this muck switch, so maybe people will believe me this time around. Or maybe it'll be the opposite and wattage is somehow mattering more on these GPUs. I don't know. We'll see. So the way the muck switch works is you click on this right here in Armory Crate. It requires a restart, like most others do, to activate, but the way it works is actually a little different than I expected. So a muck switch bypasses the integrated graphics, which connects the display directly to the GPU without that extra line of communication known as NVIDIA Optimus. So typically a MUX switch just completely makes your integrated graphics go away. So say you have Radeon graphics and you activate your MUX switch. It's supposed to just be gone, but this one still leaves AMD Radeon graphics active for some reason. Radeon is still there in the system tray and I find that in the Radeon control center that although usage is at 0%, there's still some activity there in the wattage and clocks. I even tested my benchmarks in hybrid mode the old fashioned way um, on an external monitor to bypass Optimus manually just to see if any difference was made and there wasn't but I did figure it out. So the reason Radeon is still there is because one of the USB-C ports this year is connected directly to the integrated graphics. So the iGPU still has to be active in case you plug in a monitor in that port. Um, I found that out when I first plugged my monitor in there and it didn't show up in NVIDIA control panel. Um, but Asus is actually smart for doing this because that way if you're using your laptop in a more casual setting or at an office um, you have the choice to plug into the iGPU port here so that you're not running your DGPU at full power and you can still plug in a monitor um, in iGPU mode and disable the RTX graphics completely without losing that output. This also shouldn't kill your battery as much when you're plugged into this port while on battery. And it's much nicer to have the option versus someone like Alienware on their M15 where the one USB-C port is only on the integrated graphics. So you plug a monitor in there at all and you're running in hybrid mode. You have no choice. So I'm glad Asus gave us the choice there. So speaking of battery, let's talk about it because something isn't quite right here. Now it's still great, don't get me wrong, but something isn't adding up and I believe Asus will need to provide a driver update and patch this soon. So the Ryzen 6900HS, it's not a huge generational leap, but it is a more powerful and efficient CPU. And it has RDNA 2 graphics, which means performance from the integrated GPU, the Radeon 680M, is significantly better this year. So a better CPU and an iGPU means better performance on battery, but does that come at a cost to battery life? Well, it's complicated and confusing. Using. So in hybrid mode with basic tasks running, I got about six to eight hours of battery life on my first test, which is great. That's with the DGPU still active and not disabled in Armory Crate. Uh, two tabs open, YouTube playing a video in one tab, Discord running. So if you're not watching video and you're just editing documents or something or browsing, then you can expect a little more battery. But what's weird is when I tested this in iGPU mode. Last year, setting your MS hybrid mode to Eco, which is what I mean when I say iGPU mode, this gave you much better battery life because you're completely disabled the NVIDIA graphics, so no GPU is running at all. This year, I didn't notice any change in battery life, whether or not you do that. So I'm not sure what's happening here. In fact, I couldn't really get more than six to seven hours of battery life with the RTX graphics disabled, which is just very strange and sort of disappointing um, since last year's G15 had one of the longest lasting batteries of any gaming laptop, um, hitting over 10 hours or more for some people. So does Asus need to push a driver to fix this? I don't know. It'll definitely take some more investigation and I'll come back to update everyone if I hear anything. Um, it could just be that the increased performance on battery from the iGPU is leading to more power being drawn. I'm not sure, but we'll see. Either way though, this is still not bad battery life. For example, we have the Legion 7 here with the IQ software disabled and doing the same test on that one, it averages about four hours in hybrid mode on the lowest power profile. Um, Intel laptops seem to get around that or even less depending on the model, or you just end up having to do a ton of tweaks to get over six hours on most of these. So at least on the G15, you can just unplug and it does the rest for you. Um, no jumping through any hoops to get that six plus hours.
Now gaming, I got about two hours, so not great. Uh, but the nice part is that extra performance when gaming on battery. So it's actually insane how good this thing is off the charger. I think limiting the FPS more could help it last a little longer off battery, but um, Nvidia's Battery Boost 2.0 just limits things to 30 FPS. So I don't know, I'm not a big fan of 30 FPS. So I'd rather lower graphic settings and get closer to 60 FPS than just play at 30 FPS, but that's just me. In iGPU mode, um, gaming on battery lasted just as long, about two hours. So for some reason that really came at no benefit, even though the RTX 3070 Ti is disabled. Um, so just like it did with basic tasks, and I, I don't really get why that is. Um, it should definitely be consuming less energy and helping the battery last longer, but I don't know what's up there. And yes, I know a lot of people don't recommend gaming on battery in general, uh, but sometimes I'll just casually play like Minecraft or something with my niece, or maybe I'll want to edit video on the couch or, you know, and that's where this is very much appreciated. So I actually wanted to dedicate a section of this video to talk about the performance on battery here uh, because wow, the webcam, MUX switch, all that is nice, but this might be what really sold me the most on this laptop. So just for comparison here, I have the top spec to Lenovo Legion 7 from last year with an RTX 3080 and Ryzen 9 5900HX. We're going to run Shadow of the Tomb Raider here on the highest settings possible while on battery. So doing that, we've got about 19 FPS on the Legion which is basically unplayable. Uh, move over to the G15 on battery, we are getting over 50 FPS at the same settings, nearly triple the performance, which is crazy, and both lost about the same amount of battery level from running that benchmark, so it's not like one is just eating through battery way more than the other either. Same with fan speeds, this was super quiet while achieving those results. In fact, I tested it and it's literally the same level of performance as playing on silent mode with the laptop plugged in. Even with the RTX 3070 Ti completely disabled and just running off the Radeon 680M only. Uh, we had to drop some settings down, but at 1080p medium, we still got about 34 FPS on the G15. That's with no GPU at all. So that's that's really cool to see. Um, here's a clip of me playing Forza Horizon 5 on um, eco mode. So no RTX active. This is just a built-in AMD Radeon 680M running Forza while looking this good. And that's just mind blowing. And now here's the Time Spy scores on battery compared to the Legion. As you can see, we are just getting awesome performance on battery here. Um, same with other programs like Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, I still got a score of 464 on battery in the Puget Systems benchmark, which was only like 200 points less than normal, while the Legion couldn't even run the Puget benchmark on battery without crashing. So um, also Cinebench scores are a good bit higher on the G15 when on battery compared to the Legion. Um, that's more of a CPU thing, but that's still cool to see that we're getting, you know, over 12,000 multi-core score here um, on battery. And lastly, I did a little more Premiere testing on battery, exported a video on both where the G15 just blew the Legion out of the water. I think it exported like three times faster almost. So, so yeah, the G15 is really just killing it on battery here. But yeah, let's talk about the CPU performance uh, plugged in now. So I'm going to show some benchmark scores here. I'll give some comparisons to last year's G15 and last year's Legion 7, which was like a top of the line Ryzen laptop. Uh, we're looking at about an 11% increase in CPU performance over the 2021 G15 and about a 7% increase over the 5900HX in the Legion, which ran at about three or four more watts sustained than the 6900HS did. So there's definitely been an increase in efficiency if we're scoring higher at less watts. And during my Cinebench run, the CPU CPU maintained about 74 watts, which is very nice to see on such a small device. Um, in manual mode, I actually got it to run at a sustained 79 to 80 watts, which is the max power limit, and it led to a discovery that I'll explain in a second. But yeah, a lot of 12th gen Intel laptops, the 12700H specifically, are also scoring in that 14,000 to 15,000 range. Um, if you look at Jared's text videos, um, he's been testing a lot of those. So it seems like, I mean, 12th gen Intel is uh, doing much better with CPU performance uh, while plugged in, but it seems like a unless you go for something with the 12900H or above, then, you know, those are the ones that really soar past the 16,000 to 18,000 or higher Cinebench scores. But either way, the 6900HS, the CPU performance is great. Uh, sure, it's not going to beat, you know, some of these 12th gen laptops on Intel, but it performs so well at low wattages. It's highly efficient. Battery life is great. And performance on battery is really good. So honestly, even when gaming, Intel doesn't really pull ahead by that much anyway, since most games are GPU bound and we're playing in QA. HD. So for now, I'm still team red, uh, but I'm not always glued to one side. I may one day, you know, return to Intel, but I just prefer AMD for now just because of efficiency.
efficiency and battery. So yeah, let's talk about that discovery I mentioned earlier. So there's some interesting quirks here with the 6900HS and the G15 and Armory Crate. Uh, so first of all is wattage. Manual mode allows you to set your sustained power limit all the way up to 80 watts, which is basically saying that if thermals allow, the CPU should maintain 80 watts consistently in a CPU only load. Well, while running Cinebench at max fans, I found that wasn't really the case. Um, it did boost to 80 watts, but then averaged out at about 64 watts. And I later discovered that it can actually hit that 80 watts sustained, but I'll talk about that in a second. So like I was saying, I made a weird discovery here. Switching to turbo in Armory Crate and running the same test averaged about 74 watts on the CPU compared to 64 watts. So how does turbo allow for more CPU power than manual mode? Nothing else changed to make it magically run cooler. The fans were still at 100%. In fact, it was a little quieter in turbo mode than manual. So, you know, what gives? You know, I saw higher voltage, higher clock speeds, higher wattage in turbo than manual mode, and at the same temperatures, running the same Cinebench loop and scored an extra 500 to 1000 points, but it gets weirder. So all that testing I just talked about was referring to the laptop being in hybrid mode. When I switched over to DGPU mode, these power profiles essentially flipped on which one performed better. So here in DGPU mode, Turbo now struggles to maintain 75 watts in Cinebench and averaged about 68 watts instead, where it does this sort of dip and then it comes back and scores lower. But now manual mode is just killing it, averaging 75 watts sustained, sometimes higher around 78 and hitting 80 and giving me my best score of over 14,600. And this dip in turbo mode does eventually come back, however, and almost matches manual mode, but it's about a two minute dip. So I don't quite get why it does that, um, and especially why it only dips like that in DGPU mode and not in hybrid mode. So maybe this is all just a bug in Armory Crate, but it's definitely something to keep in mind that for strictly CPU performance, turbo does better in hybrid mode and manual does better in DGPU mode. Just remember that when you're trying to benchmark your G15. But to be fair, the increase in CPU power here didn't really lead to much actual performance gained in the grand scheme of things. This is a stress test after all, and 500 to 1000 points Cinebench is only like a 5 to 8% increase. And that's when you're actually using that 75 watts sustained. Most programs will not push the CPU that hard. Um, I just thought that was an odd thing how the MUX switch is making these power profiles act differently. I also made another cool discovery. Um, thanks to AMD APU tuning utility or AATU, the 6900HS can be undervolted. Yes, you heard me right. You can undervolt this CPU. Through AATU's new Curve Optimizer feature, in their latest build, I was able to undervolt at around a negative 20 all-core curve. So negative 20 all-core is about, I don't think it's a one-to-one -one, uh, voltage ratio there. So I think it's like a, I think on like Intel or something that would equal to like minus 60 millivolt offset, which got my CPU an additional 200 to 300 megahertz clock speed under load at the same temperatures for an average of nearly 4,500 megahertz. This increased my uh, Cinebench scores by about 500 to 600 points, while decreasing fan speed, so that's awesome to see. Uh, and with this, I was able to break over a 15,000 multi-core score in Cinebench. Um, I'll link AATU in the description, and don't quote me on this, but I do believe it works on the 2021 G15s, 5900HS as well. So, and this should also theoretically help with battery life as well. And I might just end up making a whole video on that, so stay tuned for that. Moving on to other benchmarks, we have Geekbench, which also shows improvement across the board against the 2021 G15 and against the Legion. 7. And here's the RAM speed against the Legion 7s, which was a single rank X8 DDR4 RAM, while this is single rank X16 DDR5 RAM. Um, just slightly higher read write speeds out of DDR5, but as Jared's tech has shown, uh, single rank X16 RAM really isn't even a problem with DDR5. He made a whole video on how this time around there's really no performance difference between 1RX16 and 1RX8 for DDR5. So even at lower resolutions, which was really where it mattered more. So that's great to see that there's no need to worry about that this time around. Our Puget score for Adobe Premiere Pro is fairly high for a Ryzen laptop with 16 gigs of RAM at 676, uh, just barely behind the Legion 7, which had 32 gigs of RAM. And remember that, you know, Adobe Premiere loves to eat RAM, so the fact that it's even this close is great to see. Um, I'll be testing how 24 gigs of RAM compares, so stay tuned for that in another video. But yeah, like I said earlier, Puget on battery still performs great, getting us 464 on battery on silent mode. All right, so let's talk thermals. So I would say thermals have improved this year. Uh, 
the Ryzen 6900 HS seems to run quite a bit cooler and more efficiently than the 5900 HS. Um, for example, playing Apex here, the CPU stays around the 80s, and if you disable CPU turbo boost, you're looking at 70s. So, you know, compared to the Legion 7 with the 5900 HX, uh, which had some of the best cooling last year with the vapor chamber, um, the CPU on that one during Apex and Warzone easily reaches the upper 90s, and although the CPU was running at higher clock speeds, it didn't really come at much of any benefit to FPS. So as you can see here, this is a full powered 165 watt RTX 3080, and it's only getting like 10 more FPS than our mid powered 3070 Ti here. Now the CPU can be pushed to 80 watts, like you saw earlier in Cinebench, only in a CPU only workload. And it will just about hit that mark depending on the task, but it will raise temps much closer to their max, um, often hitting about 95. So um, in Cinebench though, we're hitting the upper 80s to mid 90s in temperatures, uh, but that's, you know, with a sustained like 75 watts around that area on the CPU, which is impressive. Um, the good thing with Ryzen CPUs is that they're so efficient that lower power levels like 30 to 40 watts or even 15 watts in games works really well. And I'm also um, surprised and impressed with the GPU temperatures on this year's model. So the 3070 Ti, um, it runs fairly cool for the wattage that it pushes out. So on the 2021 model, you can modify the VBIOS to increase the GPU's wattage. Um, I made a whole video on this and when I did this on my 2021 G15, I increased the wattage to like 125 and the GPU would shoot up to 85 degrees really quickly when I did that, even at max fans. So, but now we've got wattage hovering around, you know, 115 to 120 when gaming, but the temperatures seem to stay in like the 70s, um, even for extended periods. So there's definitely an increase in efficiency somewhere because even at 60% fans, the GPU barely touches 80 um, and still runs at the same wattage. You you can also undervolt the GPU for better performance and lower temperatures here. Check out my optimization guide for more info on that. So ambient temperatures here for me with two tabs open, Discord and Armory Crate open, were about 51 degrees Celsius on the CPU and 48 degrees on the GPU. Um, on battery, they were both in the low 40s. So these are very acceptable ambient temperatures, so I'm pleased with that. Okay, so fan noise is different on this 2022 model. Uh, they've tuned the fan curves completely differently this year, and it's kind of strange. Uh, before I get into that though, I will say that silent mode doesn't seem to have changed and still runs extremely quietly, even when gaming. In fact, I think it might even be better this year at keeping the fans completely off when you're doing basic tasks. So that's good to see. Um, and that's one of the things I really love about this laptop, and it's hard to find that in a gaming laptop. Um, I've had a lot of problems with other ones like the Legion 7i, for example, for being pretty noisy in quiet mode or the fans just constantly ramp up and down. So Asus did a really good job tuning the fans here. But now for the changes. So let me just start with, in my opinion, manual mode is the way to go. And I'll explain that in a second. So first of all, turbo mode is now a whopping five decibels louder this year. Now, five decibels might not sound like much, but that's actually roughly three times as intensive a sound as 50 decibels. But it's just the way they tuned it. So turbo mode on the 2021 G15, uh, it ran the fans kind of conservatively at around like 60 to 70 percent um, but this year the fans in turbo will hit 100 percent speed when gaming and i actually found that unnecessary So I started experimenting. Um, to test this out, I went into manual mode and I made a fan curve that I sort of felt like matched how turbo mode was last year in the 2021 G15. So I set the fans at around a 60% curve um, and I tested to see if the temperatures and performance got worse. But in fact, the performance stayed about the same. And yes, temperatures did go up a little bit, but they didn't really go up enough to be concerning. So this will definitely be how I run my G15 when gaming because full blast fans just really aren't necessary here. And I kind of I wish they just had a preset profile for this, maybe like a turbo light mode or something. I don't know. But I have my manual preset saved for this at least because unless no one's home and I have headphones on, this will probably be how I play. Now, performance mode cuts the fans back quite a bit, but it sacrifices a lot of performance from the GPU this year. And I honestly just wouldn't recommend using performance mode at all when gaming, um, unless you're playing in like 1080p or just really low settings, because they really just cut back the GPU on that for some reason. Um, otherwise, outside of gaming, fans, like I said, are super quiet, um, mostly off when doing basic tasks. Um, and I just appreciate that because I hate when I'm on YouTube or something and my fans start ramping up out of nowhere and I'm just like, why? Especially when I'm around other people it's just embarrassing. All right, so gaming performance. 
I want to preface this with a few interesting things about the 3070 Ti here. So the 3070 Ti is an interesting card. Last year, most 3070s performed fairly closely unless they didn't have a muck switch or wattage was like super low, like less than 90 or something. Then, you know, of course they would be a little further down the list, but this year with the Ti GPUs, I've seen drastic differences in performance across different gaming laptops with this GPU, even at the same wattage, and I don't really get it. So like the Alienware M15 R7, for example, has the 140 watt 30 3070Ti, and in TimeSpy, the graphics score is around 11,600, which is great. Um, and that's only 20 watts more than the G15. So why does the G15 only score 10,600 graphics score? A whole thousand points more just for 20 watts? Like, that just I don't know, that doesn't really make sense. Um, especially since last year, the Legion 5 Pro had a whole 40 more watts on its GPU, and it only scored like 500, you know, maybe a thousand points more max on TimeSpy. And then you've got the MSI GP66 here, which has the 150 watt 3070 Ti. And even though this one is only 30 more watts of power, it scores about 2000 points higher on TimeSpy graphics, according to Jared's tech with a whopping 12,400 GPU score, putting it above many 3080 laptops from 2021. Um, and you know, it's only 10 more watts than the Alienware and getting a whole thousand points higher than that one. And that's higher than any other 3070 Ti that I've seen personally. And they do have a small overclock on it, but not enough of one to get the score that high. So I don't know what's up there. Um, that's just a lot higher of a score for only 30 more watts and even though that graphic score is about equal to a legion 7 3080 it still it even surpasses that one in games um not by much but it's there so something has improved with these ti gpus and something is weird about them um it's just hard to say what so like i mentioned earlier though uh we have 20 more watts going to the gpu over the 2021 g15 however i noticed that the default overclock found in turbo mode was cut in half this year so um now it's a very small overclock of plus 50 core which is almost nothing. Um, so I wonder if they did that for thermal reasons. I don't really know. But despite them decreasing that overclock, I actually found that this 3070 Ti can be overclocked very easily this year with almost no increase in temperatures. Uh, maybe I just got lucky, but I found out that I could easily overclock my GPU to plus 200 core. Um, I even tried plus 250 and it did just fine. Um, and then, you know, plus 150 memory. Um, I've tried up to, I think, plus 250 memory and it did great. So that boosts the time spy score to a freaking nearly 11,500 500 graphics, which is insanely impressive for a laptop this size. Um, this definitely will close the gap between this and the other 3070 Ti laptops. So I'll include um, a few overclocked FPS numbers in the comparison just to show you all what I mean. So like maybe these other Ti GPUs, sure, they might not have many more watts, but maybe they just have a much higher clock speed. So by overclocking, we're able to sort of match them now. But yeah, another thing, I don't really see many people talking about this, but with the Ti GPUs came Nvidia's Max-Q fourth generation. I don't know if the previous non-TI mobile GPUs got these upgrades, but basically NVIDIA claims to have made enhancements to Max-Q GPUs like this one with a few features, uh, Rapid Core Scaling, CPU Optimizer, and Battery Boost 2.0. I'll just talk about them real quick. So Rapid Core Scaling reduces the number of GPU cores active for specific processes where using full cores wouldn't make a difference. Uh, CPU Optimizer is supposed to improve gaming performance by shifting some of the CPU's power when it's not entirely needed to the GPU. I mean, I thought that's what Dynamic Boost was, but but sure. Um, and then there's the Battery Boost 2.0, which is basically their new and improved Battery Boost to give you good performance and better battery life when gaming using AI. I don't know what that means, but when I activated it, all it did was cap my games at 30 FPS, so I don't know how that involves AI, but okay. So I don't know if all of that is just marketing talk or if there's actually improvement in those areas over the regular 3070s, but they definitely did something to make these able to run at 120 watts now on the G15 without overheating and just performing better even when it's not hitting 120 watts, which I'll show you here soon. All right, so here it is. Let's get into gaming performance. So I ran most of the, all of these on DGPU mode on the Turbo Power Profile, and I did compare these to manual mode just to make sure that, you know, there wasn't a huge difference between Turbo and manual. And for the most part, they perform about the same because Turbo mode just, it works really well for games. But like I said earlier, that's actually not how I recommend playing. You can get the same performance with a lot less fan noise using manual mode in Armory Crate. You know, just take the time, set up a few different presets, and that's when you'll really appreciate what the G15 can do. 
All right, so let's start with uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider here. This is the highest preset at 1440p on DGPU mode. You can see here the new G15 is passing last year's Legion 5 Pro by about 4 FPS. So pretty on par with some of the um, top tier 3070s from last year, even though it's running 20 watts less. So that's pretty good to see. Um, it's also fairly close to the Razer Blade 17, um, which had a 3080. So only 3 FPS away from that. And then um, only about 6 FPS away from last year's mech 15 3080 which was the full 165 watt gpu so i mean considering most of the laptops on this chart are 3080s or just way higher tier wattage uh, gpus this is not a bad result as you can see we're getting about 10 more fps than last year's g15 and that's with it hooked up to an external screen um, in hybrid mode we're actually an additional 5 fps so 15 fps higher than last year's g15 on this benchmark i'm also going to throw in a couple of laptops from jared's tech that he is tested on this same benchmark. So with these 3070 Ti's, the GP66, like I mentioned earlier, just hits way above its class at 107 FPS on this bench. And then the new Mech 15 with the uh, 12th gen Intel is hitting 104 FPS. So, you know, those are a good 10 to 13 FPS ahead here in this benchmark. But the uh, GP66 is especially bulkier. So you can see those higher wattage 3070 Ti's are pulling ahead a good little bit. So, but these are also 12th gen Intel's, which seems to help with this benchmark. Um, at 1080p, I have a lot more data here. So the new G15 is getting 127 FPS in this benchmark, um, which puts it ahead actually of the Legion 7i from last year with the 3070. Uh, also puts it ahead of the new G14 and about 7 FPS ahead of the Legion 5 Pro from last year and 19 FPS ahead of the G15 from last year on this. That's with it on an external screen. If you have the G15 in hybrid mode, which is its natural state from last year, we are now 31 FPS ahead of the G15 from last year at 1080p. So 1080p is more CPU bound, so ju that just makes sense. So that is a nice improvement in this benchmark. Obviously, you know, most of the other ones above this are all 3080s, which is why it looks like it's further down on this chart. But, you know, you're putting 120 watt 3070 Ti against 165 watt 3080s and, you know, these new 150 watt 3070 Ti's. So, you know, it's obviously going to hit below those, but it's actually holding its weight really well in this benchmark. And I'm throwing in some other benchmarks from Jared's Tech again here at the top. We have the Strix Scar, the Legion 5 i Pro with 12th Gen Intel. So you can see those 12th Gen Intels are really dominating this one. All right, now Forza Horizon 5. The 2022 G15 is right up there with these 165 watt 3080s. We're hitting about the same as the Legion 7 with a 3080, uh, which was like, you know, one of the top laptops from last year. Uh, we're ahead of the new Razer Blade 15 with the 3080 Ti. So that's great to see. That's one from Jared's tech as well. And we are 10 FPS ahead of last year's G15 on an external screen and 14 FPS ahead of it in hybrid mode. So a nice improvement. Um, drop it down to 1080p. We're actually ahead of a few 3080s. 80s now. So we are at 83 FPS here, uh, which is beating out the Legion 7, Mech 15, and new Razer Blade 15 from Jared's Tech. Um, this is 10 FPS higher than last year's G15 on an external screen, 14 FPS higher than last year's G15 on the laptop screen. I actually haven't tested any 3060s, but I have this one from Jared's Tech, which is the new Tough A15. That's 140 watt 3060, and it seems to do a lot better than most 3060s. So to see this one like so much higher than that is, is nice. But it could be that it's just being limited by VRAM in this game. Um, it seems to score much higher in other benchmarks. All right, now on Control, which is a GPU heavy game, um, we're hitting, I mean, really across the board here. Everyone's getting in the mid 40s. This is with the high preset uh, ray tracing on high. So yeah, we're hitting about the same as these 3080s, Legion 7, Mech 15, Legion 7i. So that's that's really good to see. Um, definitely happy with that. This game is just really well optimized and I never really see too much of a difference here when ray tracing is on. But, you know, you throw DLSS in there and still pretty close, only two FPS behind uh, those top 3080s from last year and about on par with uh, last year's G15 too so not much improvement in this game. Now, Call of Duty Warzone, um, this is max settings, ray tracing on, uh, and we're in the Warzone training area, which does give you a little more FPS than when you're actually playing a, a game. But in 1440p, the G15 is getting 113 FPS, which is really good. Everything above it is 3080s, really high wattage 3080s. So to be like within like 10 to 15 FPS of those is great. Um, I'm super happy with that. And we're about 10 FPS ahead of last year's G15 in this. And then um, if you turn DLSS on, the gap does increase a little bit here between this one and the top 3080s. But again, I mean, yes, it's at the bottom, but it's only behind, you know, 165 watt 3080, which is just a much more powerful GPU. 
And on Cyberpunk, this is the Ultra preset uh, running the benchmark in the game. At QHD, we are we're getting 49 FPS here, which is only about 3 FPS more than last year's, but still a really good result considering that everything above is a 3080 and it's only like 5 or 6 FPS ahead. So, you know, the GE76 is on another level though. That, that one's just... I have a video for that one on the way and that thing is just always just killing it in benchmark. Now, if we do the Ray Tracing Ultra preset, we are hitting about 47 FPS here. Not much of an improvement about 4 FPS ahead of last year's though. And then I went ahead and also just tested an, on the high preset just so that we could have at least one preset here that's hitting about 60 FPS. So you got 59 here which is about 6, 7, 8 FPS behind the top tier 3080s from last year. So still very happy with that. Red Dead Redemption 2, this is with the favor quality slider maxed out and we're running the benchmark here at QHD. We're getting about 62 FPS, so that's really great to see, about 7 FPS higher than last year's G15 after I applied the 115 watt VBIOS. Unfortunately, I don't have any data for where, where I just ran it on the stock 100 watt, but for it to be seven FPS ahead of the 115 watt VBIOS, that's that's a nice improvement for a GPU heavy game like this. And we're only about five FPS behind the Legion 7 and GE66, so pretty good. So dropping that down to 1080p, same benchmark. Um, now we're about eight FPS ahead of last year's G15, again with the 115 watt VBIOS and about five, to seven, eight um, FPS behind these 3080s here. Now, Apex Legends, as you saw earlier, I just recently added this into my benchmarks, but um, averaging about 127 FPS, and that's playing a pretty intensive game with a lot of things going on. There's obviously dips that make the average go down like that. I find that it usually hovers around like between 130 to 145 FPS, but obviously when there's a bunch of explosions happening and stuff like that, it's going to dip a little bit. But yeah, you know, that's about 9, 10 FPS behind the Legion 7, which is one of the top 3080 laptops. So, I mean, that's crazy. That's really good to see and definitely happy with that result. And we'll end on another more CPU bound game here. We have CSGO. Um, this is the Uletical benchmark at 1440p. Um, we're doing great here. I mean, 346 FPS. Uh, it's only like 10 FPS ahead of last year's, but still a great result it's right up there with a lot of these uh, 3080s and higher wattage 3070s. And obviously, you know, I'll throw in the G15 in high remote here. You can see 194 FPS. Like that's, we're almost doubling that, you know? So that muck switch really helps in games like this. And here it is in 1080p. So, you know, now we're getting 438 FPS here, whereas the G15 last year in hybrid mode, if you weren't on an external screen, you're only getting 268, which is still high, but you know, we're almost doubling that. So the muck switch, you know, this is really where it comes in handy. So the average FPS increase uh, between the 2022 and the 2021, um, this is with it on an external monitor. So you're getting just a little over a 9% increase um, at 1440p in FPS. And at 1080p, you're getting about a 12.5% increase. Um, keep in mind, like I said, this is with the G15 on an external monitor. I know that there's many of you that don't use it on external monitor. So this is, you know, where that MUX switch comes in handy. We're bypassing Optimus here. So now if we're talking strictly on the laptop screen itself, um, with that MUX switch, when you factor that in, at 1440p, we're getting a 17% increase in FPS. And 1080p, we're now at a 27% increase in FPS. And this is without even factoring in CSGO. I didn't do that because I, I knew it was throw the data off too much. So between all these games, I mean, 17% is actually, that's actually a pretty good increase for 1440p, which is what you'll usually be playing on. And the 27% increase in 1080p, now that is just, that is really great to see. Because I know it does look blurrier when you switch to 1080p, but sometimes it is helpful to, you know, really just push the frames a little bit. So to get an almost 30% increase at 1080p, I think that's pretty awesome. Again, I'm going to link all the laptop data from Jared's Tech. I'll link every video that I used to get that data in the description. So be sure to check his out where he reviews some of these. But yeah, I mean, you know, considering most of the benchmark data I have here is 3080s, um, these are all 165 watt 3080s here. So the fact that this 120 watt 3070 Ti, you know, even though it's one generation ahead, this was never supposed to be a huge improvement to begin with. To see it up there with those uh, 3080s, you know, between this new Ti GPU and the MUX switch, it is just really nice to see that. And I'm super pleased with the performance on this thing. Um, you know, I wish I had more 3060 and 3070 laptops in this chart. That would definitely make it look a lot better than uh, being below these 3080s, but still, at least it's close, and that is what matters. And this is a really thin and light machine, too, compared to those 3080s. That Legion 7, you know, that one's chunkier. It's like two or three pounds heavier with the charging brick. Uh, GE76, that thing's a monster. It's, I mean, that thing's massive. So the fact that it's even getting close to that is is really nice. 
So there you have it, um, the 2022 G15. Uh, it's a beautiful laptop and it performs well above its weight class. Um, Nvidia has a few quirks to work out, I think, with these TI GPUs because there's so much performance disparity between different laptops, even at similar wattages. And um, Asus, I think, has a few quirks to work out with Armory Crate, but that doesn't really hold things back too much. And there's plenty of room to boost performance like far beyond stock on this thing. Like I mentioned earlier, I highly recommend running in manual mode and overclocking your GPU a bit if needed because it can definitely handle it. You know, so as far as gaming, we've got a laptop here getting roughly, getting roughly almost 10% performance increase um, over last year's G15 at QHD. And uh, considering, you know, if you don't factor in the MUX switch, about 17% increase at QHD over last year's G15. And, and only about 10 to 15% behind last year's full powered Legion 7, 165 watt, 3080. So like in a game where the G15 gets like 90 FPS, the Legion 7 will get about 100 FPS. You know, whether that's noticeable or not depends on the user, but most people, I feel like would not notice. And same with coming from the 2021, uh, there's a good chance you might not notice that increase in FPS there either. You know, maybe if you're playing on the screen itself and you never were using an external monitor before to get that extra FPS, you might notice that increase. But I think if you're considering buying a gaming laptop and you don't have one already, this new G15 is one of the best options out there, especially when we consider the CPU. Um, the 6900HS is a nice increase in performance, does amazing on battery, and that Radeon 680M iGPU just performs amazing on battery. Um, you know, throw in the new webcam with Windows Hello support, the MUX switch, DDR5 RAM, Gen 4 SSD speeds, uh, USB 4 Thunderbolt compatible ports, and I mean, you've got a great package deal here. So my final thoughts, you've got a very thin and light gaming laptop here with a fairly small power brick. It's portable, it performs well, and it has some nice premium features. It gets quite a bit higher in FPS than the G14 and it gets more battery life and can run quieter and cooler than the M16. It has a higher color gamut than most other gaming laptops, decent screen brightness, um, an amazing keyboard and glass trackpad, great performance on battery, great battery life in general, uh, lots of performance customization options in Armory Crate, fairly good speakers, it can be undervolted, and just overall great specs. So, you know, of course, most 12th gen Intel laptops will pull ahead in CPU bound scenarios. But to me, that's just not worth the trade offs in battery life. Because I mean, most games are GPU bound anyway. And in most applications, I don't know if you'll really see or notice that um, increased CPU performance other than benchmark scores. But you know, overall, I'm extremely happy with this machine personally, and I'm glad I picked one up. I'll definitely be making more videos on this, like mismatching DDR5 RAM and seeing what that does, as well as putting this up against other machines. So stay tuned for those and make sure you're subscribed. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.